Father, we thank you that again we're able to come into this place. We know, Lord, there's a multitude of needs within our church family. Father, I think of some in the hospital right now and, and their situations are not good. Give them a sense of your presence. Be with their families, Lord, as they sit with them. And Lord, their hearts ache. I just pray that they know your presence in a powerful way. And Lord, that they would just cry out to you and you give them strength. We know, Lord, that you are sufficient for every need that we have. We remember the Dunlop family tonight and just continue to pray for each one of them. We pray especially for Bob tonight, Lord, you'd put your healing hand upon his body. Give him the strength, Lord, to be able to go tomorrow to that service. And we pray, Lord, that uh, it would be an encouragement to each one of their hearts. Father, we thank you that you're a God that is with us when we go through the trials and the difficulties of life. And thank you that we'll learn more about that even this evening. I pray again, Lord, that you'd be pleased to put your hand on this preacher, open my mouth, put a blessing on my lips, and use me to meet a need in the lives of your people tonight. May they be encouraged as we look into your word. In Christ's precious name, amen. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think, a strange, think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you. The fiery trial. How many of you are looking forward to fiery trials? Not many of us, right? That's not something that we really appreciate. But he says here, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first... What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. We want to talk tonight about when your faith is on trial. Some of you might say, I'm there tonight, preacher. I'm going through it. Some of you may just have come out of one. Uh, I got bad news for the rest of you. You're headed for one because that's the way it is in life. There's just you're out of one into another one, and we're going to face the difficulties of life. If there's a question that I'm asked most by people that I pastor over the years, it's probably this question here. Why is this happening to me? Now, it comes in different forms, but people want to know. Why? I'm a good person. I read my Bible, I, I pray, I go to church. I, why am I facing difficulty in my life? Well, Peter tells us that there's three different kinds of suffering that we can go through, and I'll jump to those real quick here. There's common suffering. You say, what's common suffering? It's what you get for being human. It's just a fact of life. You, we, we were born... We have these bodies that have been affected by sin, they get disease, our joints wear out, arthritis hits us, pain comes. It's just part of being human that we're going to face in life. And uh, we live in a fallen world, and so there's going to be difficulties. Then there's carnal suffering. Sufferings that, that really I cause myself, I bring on myself. You ever done that? You've done something stupid, something bad, and the consequences came you don't have to ask, why is this happening to me? I can tell you why it's happening. We made the wrong choices in life. If I make a dumb decision and go out after service tonight and don't start a rumor, no, this isn't going to happen, but if I go out after service tonight and get drunk and I wake up tomorrow morning and my head's throbbing, why? Why is this happening to me? Well, because I made a dumb choice is what happens, right? You have a hangover. and The suffering comes with that. 
So that's carnal suffering, and there's all kinds that we could go into with that. I'm not tonight. The area that Peter is primarily concerned about here is, is what we would call Christian suffering. And that's when we suffer as a Christian because we're Christians, for what we stand for. I had a, a pastor I talked to yesterday, and he was telling me how he got a call from CBC News questioning him about, and I'm not even going to go there and say what it was, but uh, an issue that's very much in the news today and uh, trying to trap him. And so we, we're going to have to be aware of that. We're going to have to expect that in our day. They're out to get us simply because we're what? Simply because we believe in Christ, and that will automatically make us different from this world because we do believe in something. We believe in the Lord. And so he says, when you suffer for the right thing, we call that sometimes suffering redemptively, right? Because we're redeemed in the Lord, and it has a, a benefit to it in our own lives. Can you suffer redemptively? Well, the best example of that is who? It's Jesus Christ. He suffered and died on the cross, and he did it redemptively for us. And, and our salvation pours out of that, and so we, we rejoice in that. He didn't suffer because he did anything wrong, did he? He suffered because, listen to this, he was in the will of God. I want you to think about that. Can you suffer if you're in the will of God? Can bad things happen to you if you're in the will of God? Well, I want you to know tonight that they absolutely can. And, uh, but what you need to understand, even when you suffer, if you're in the will of God, it's always for your good. God has some purpose or benefit to that. Now, whoever's running the outline tonight is going to wonder what happened in pastor's message. I want to talk to you for a bit here. Didn't plan to spend this much time on it, but then I worked on the message after I gave the outline to the secretary, and uh, this kind of came out of that, and I think it will be helpful and beneficial to you, but I, I, I want to talk about detours, dead ends, and dry holes. How many of you have found that life sometimes, you're going here, and it makes you take a detour? Just try driving anywhere in the city of Fredericton right now. You're going to find out they're going to make you detour somewhere off of Smite Street or wherever it is you're going. There's detours that come into our lives. There's, there's dead ends that you'll go to. Some of those detours, I, I took one uh, about a month ago, and it, it, it took me on a dead end. You know, where do you go now? It's the street ended. Where do I go? And uh, somebody must have turned the signs around or something, thought they were being funny, but uh, I didn't find it all that funny. And then there's dry holes in life where things just totally dry up. And in order to look at this, I want to take you over to the book of Exodus. And I want you to come to chapter 13 of Exodus, if you would, please. Exodus chapter 13. And if you come down with me to verse 17, I'm going to skip all the preamble here. And it says, that it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go. You remember that whole thing that he went through and the plagues and so on that came on Egypt and God had said, let my people go. Finally, uh, he says, okay, go, get out of here. And it says, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them. But listen, God did lead them, right? Did God lead them? All right. But he didn't lead them, it says, by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was what? It was near. If you're going from Egypt to the promised land, the straight way is right through where the Philistines were. And you know what God did? Now, could God have marched them right through the Philistines? Yeah, he could have done that. But he takes them on a detour. And he takes them over by the, you know, the story, the, the Red Sea, and parks them over there. And you know, you all already know what's coming because you've read the story, and you're thinking in your heart, no, 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 God, don't, don't take them there. Why? What's going to happen? They're going to get trapped there. Pharaoh's going to come after them. He's going to cause some all kinds of problems for them. And, and, and what I want you to remember tonight is sometimes... You can be in the will of God and find yourself in the biggest of messes and wonder, what do I, where do I go from here? What do I do now in this situation? You can find yourselves on some back roads and dead ends, 
detours, and in dry holes in life. And you're wondering, if God's leading me, God, do you even know how to read a map? <laughs> you just kind of wonder, how did I get here? Some people were probably wondering that this morning when we were going through all that history. How, how in the world did I get here in this service this morning? And the tendency and the danger is you begin to think because everything isn't going the way I think it should be going, I must be out of the will of God, so maybe I need to change the direction I'm in. And the fact is, if you're in the will of God, you don't need to change. Is that right? If you're following in the will of God, where he's leading you, that's where you need to go. And sometimes, can he lead us into some difficulty? That's what we're seeing here in this particular passage that we're looking at. And, and the difficulties come despite the fact that we are literally traveling on the king's highway. It's the road, he's, the pathway he's laid down for us, and he's leading us towards the journey of joy. Is that right? But along the way, he's going to give us some things that are maybe difficult to deal with. And the, the, the first thing I want to call here, in verse 17 and 18, he said he led them by way of, uh, did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, though that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness. He led them where? Around. By what way? God, are, are you, you crazy? You missing something here? God, you're going to lead us into the wilderness? Yeah. It's where I need to take you right now. In my will, that's where you need to be. Did you ever think that that's where you need to be sometimes? I didn't say where you want to be, but where you need to be. Because God has a purpose and a direction that he's taking in your life. And, and you'll find yourself in that place. <laughs> One, because... Let me ask you a question. Did Israel know anything about the Philistines? Did they? I don't think they knew much about them. They've been slaves down here in Egypt for 400 years. They weren't worried about the Philistines over here. They didn't realize that if we go this way, where it's a straight way, we're going to end up in war. They didn't know that. But listen, they didn't know, need to know that. Because he knows. Remember this morning? He knows. And he knew that that wouldn't be the best way for them to take at this time. That maybe they need to go through some deep slogging out there in the wilderness, and run into some situations that they haven't been dealing with for a long time because they've just been kind of going through the motions of being slaves to the Egyptians. There were lessons that they needed to learn. God brings them out there because he's literally putting them through a training process. And I look back on my life and some of the things I went through as a teenager and other things in my life, you know what? They were all, all part of the training process. We call it sanctification process, any name you want to throw at it, but it's God working in our lives to change us and prepare us and grow us and strengthen us so we can face the Philistines when it's time to face the Philistines. When God says, now is time, then we'll be strong enough to deal with those things. But God knew what was going on. He knew it wasn't a good time to take them into battle, so he led them this way, even though that's going to end up looking like they're going to go into battle. But God's going to step in and intervene. We because you know the story ahead of time. And uh, <coughs> I don't know where you are tonight, but it just might be that you're very center of the will of God, but you're finding yourself, it seems like God's leading me about. It doesn't seem the way that I should be going at all. It doesn't feel right, right? It doesn't have to feel right as long as you know that God is leading this, that your eye is on Him, you've been in the Word, you're on your knees in prayer, you're seeking to walk in the will of God, and you trust Him to lead you. And you're going to wonder some of those times, it feels like I'm going in circles. Don't you think it felt that way for Israel in the wilderness when the, you know, they turned back from the land and God's, who was what? God was what? Leading them. In the wilderness, they were going in circles out there for 40 years, well, 38, traveling and traveling because of disobedience in their lives. But God led them, and he led them on a, a detour. And sometimes we need those detours of life because we're not ready. 
I know a lot, a lot of people that I graduated from, from Bible school with. I was one of them. <laughs> we went out of there, you know, we're going to do wonders and marvelous things. And man, I went out there and I labored and worked and sweated and everything I could do for two years and saw nothing happen. I mean, nothing. Didn't see a soul saved, didn't see the church grow. So discouraged, I was wondering, God, did you really intend for me to be a preacher? I'd just be honest. And I told you a few weeks ago how I went uh, to a conference and a friend and I spent several hours in prayer and it was God touched me. And I came back and I preached the same sermons, same kind of sermons. But people began to come into the church. I didn't even visit them. They just came. They got saved. They said, hey, we got this relative over here. Would you mind going to see him? I go to see them. They get saved. We were seeing 40 people a year saved out in a little country church out in Cross Creek, New Brunswick. And I want you to know it was not me. That was God. But he had to take me where first? I was going in circles, just going in circles and not seeing God do anything in my life. Some of you might be there tonight. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Continue on following after the Lord. And all this we're going to find out was just part of God's training program. He's going to say, I was doing this to test you and prove you and strengthen you. I wanted to do some things in your life. Understand, it's never purposeless. That's not the way God works. He has his purposes. He's leading us and teaching us and, and getting us ready for things in the future. You know, when God was trying to get Moses to be a leader, do you know what he had to do? Took him out in the wilderness for 40 years to prepare him. When he called David to be king, anointed him to be king, and then for how many years? Got chased around by Saul, <laughs> going in circles in the wilderness. Was he in the will of God? Absolutely in the will of God through all of that. It was in the way that the Lord led him. The apostle Paul got saved. I mean, he had tremendous mind and training already under Judaism and a Pharisee and knowledge of the Bible and so on. And God says, you know what, Paul, you're not ready yet. Let's go out in the desert of Arabia for three years. He needed that. My desert was New Brunswick Bible Institute. Took me there for three years. Sometimes we need the desert experiences. That's where God gets a hold of our lives. That's where God speaks to us and talks to us. But I want to encourage you tonight. It doesn't mean you're out of God's will because life is tough. Because things aren't necessarily going the way that you want them to go. I read this this week, all the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. We used to sing that, right? He still does it. He still does it. Well, sometimes <laughs> we go and we face the detours. Other times... We face in life the dead ends. Now, a detour is frustrating because I want to go here and I got to go out around here and I'm going to waste gas and all that stuff and time. But at least you're moving. <clears throat> but what do you do when you, you should drive up there and it's a dead end? You can't go anywhere. You got a line of cars behind you. You can't even get turned around. What do you do in those moments when you face the dilemmas? of the dead ends in your life. Well, look at Exodus chapter 14 and uh, come down to verse 8 here for a moment. Chapter 14 of verse 8. And it says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. You know, they were pumped. They are filled with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and he overtook them camping by the what? By the sea. What are they doing down by the sea? Can you say it? God led them there. Doesn't make any sense to us, but it's all part of the plan of God. And you know, when Israel saw the, they heard them probably first, the feet of the horses stomping, and then they see the dust rising, and they know it's Pharaoh's come after them, they panicked. But the neat thing about this, there wasn't a moment of panic in heaven, and God said, oh no, what have I done? What kind of a mess have I got my people into? He knew exactly why they were there and what he was going to do. 
He was going to show them that you're going to be in place in life where you can't do anything except look up and cry out to me. Thank God for Moses because he was crying out to God, right? Saying, God, what do we do here? And you're wondering, did God lead them there? Back up to chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, <laughs> God led them. He said, this is where you're to go. I want you to do this. He even told them, Pharaoh's going to come after you. So I want you down here. This is where I want you. See in front of you, a mountain on this side, Pharaoh on this side, nowhere's to go. You're trapped completely. Why? So they'd realize we're at the end of ourselves. And sometimes God will do that in our lives. Bring us to a place where we come to an end of our abilities. Our problem is we think, got to do something, even if it's the wrong thing, and we're manipulating and maneuvering and doing all these things we're doing instead of just getting on our knees and looking to God and saying, God, would you, would you lead us? Would you open the way? Would you show us what it is you want us to do at this moment? I think there's times where we need to do that as individuals. I think there's times we need to do that as a church. Just go before God. Get on our faces and cry out to Him. They weren't there because of poor leadership on Moses' part, or because Moses couldn't read a map. They were there because God led them, and that's exactly where God wanted them. And there was a purpose to what He was doing. If you look at verse 3, it says, For Pharaoh will save the children of Israel. They are bewildered in the land. They don't know what they're doing. The wilderness is closed in on them. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army. That, that points to the purpose of God here. Because God, I said, always has a purpose. And it says that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. You know what? Sometimes in order for the people in this world to understand that he's God, God will put us at a dead end where we don't know what to do or where to turn. So those people get to see God bring deliverance into our lives and take us through a difficult circumstance that we couldn't have handled on our own and we didn't know what to do. And God moves in and God uh, gives what we need in those circumstances. Down in chapter 14 and uh, verse 13, he gives us some instructions here. Moses said to the people, first of all, don't be afraid. You hear that a lot in Scripture, don't you? Don't be afraid. Cheer up. God's here. Don't be afraid. Secondly, do what? I want you to stand still. I want you to stop your murmuring and complaining. See, God's trying to teach them a lesson about that. And we haven't got time to get into all that, but that's a big part of the early chapters of Exodus, God is just trying to teach the children of Israel to stop their murmuring and complaining. And he says, stand still, and then what's the next one? I want you to see the salvation of the Lord. God wants people to see God moving and God bringing deliverance. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. It's a great place when you can get there in faith, where you say, you know what, I'm going to stand still. And when he says, I want you to see, he's not saying you can see this all taking place. He's not saying see it after it, the deliverance takes place. He's saying, by faith, I want you to see that your God knows the way through the wilderness. I want you to see that God knows the way of salvation and deliverance for you and I want you to save God by faith. I believe you're going to provide us this deliverance. See it by faith. And then, as they're standing there, the next command is going to be this. Go forward. Don't have to stand still anymore. When you see by faith, God says, go forward. And you're saying, go forward. If you've been standing there as part of Israel, there's this Red Sea in front of you. You've got to walk out in the water. And he says, but Moses, uh, before they go forward, just take your rod and stick it out over the Red Sea. And when he does that, all of a sudden, there's a 16-lane 16, 16 highway through the Red Sea to go across. Because what? God made a way when there was no way. And when they couldn't make a way. Because that's the way God, God works. And because of that, he's going to have to put us, if we're going to have these experiences of seeing God's deliverance, he's going to put us into some, some uh, difficult situations sometimes where we don't know what to do and how to handle them. 
I remember getting a call on a Friday evening. We had just left the Cross Creek Church and moved to Goddard, Ontario. And we got a call that there was a family just down the road from us that had started coming to the church. A Selleck family. And the mother had a 10-year-old son. And while she was standing, had been standing a moment before with him in the driveway, she doesn't even know why he decided to run across the road and was struck by a car and killed right in front of her. How do you deal with that? How do you handle those situations? Like, I, I don't know. But I know this, if you look to him and you see him, he's got a salvation for you even in that situation of life. I watched my mom and dad, and you people get sick of hearing me say this, but I watched them walk that highway three times. I saw my baby brother die. I found him dead. My older sister, a year, 13 months older than me, lived her whole life in a wheelchair. I saw her die at nine years of age. I saw my parents deal with that. And I saw my older brother, five years older, killed in a car crash three months short of his 21st birthday. And I saw my mom and dad through that with his casket sitting there in our living room. Mom come out of the bedroom and say, your dad and I prayed tonight to receive Christ as our Savior. You see, even in that which is horrendous, the worst nightmare you could think of, God has a way and some purpose. I don't understand it all. I was at a graduation party for my nephew's son yesterday, and a lady came up. She said, oh, this is going on in my son's life, and this is my, my daughter's husband's life, and I don't understand it. Why does God let this happen? I said, I don't know, but I can guarantee you this. God has a purpose, and he has a plan, and there's something that he's working at in these lives and in your life as you walk through these difficulties and hard situations in your life, and so he tells them here, <laughs> gives us instructions, don't be afraid. The only way you can't be afraid is if you place your faith in God. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord by faith. Trust him. Prepare your heart. And then what? Go forward. Go forward with the Lord and see God work and do great and mighty and awesome things in your life. And then the third thing here. And I, I saw in, in this passage, we need to go to chapter 15 of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, and that is the disappointments of dry holes. I mean, it's tough when you're run into to all these difficulties in your life, but then you think, hey, we're making some progress, got through the Red Sea, got this great God, you're singing songs, right? In chapter 15 to the Lord, chapter 15, verse 2, it says this. The Lord is my strength and song, and he's become my salvation. He's my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Man, it's just wonderful. Our God is so wonderful. Come down to verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness, and they found what? No water. Moses was pretty certain. He knew the desert pretty well. There's a, there's a spring over here. <laughs> We're going to get something to drink. And he got there, and it's a dry hole. It didn't have what they needed, no water. Now, when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters for the waters for what? They were bitter. So they, they're at this dry hole. They, they're wondering, what's gone wrong in our lives? What have, we, what have we done wrong? Have they done anything wrong at that point? Nothing. And the problem with us sometimes we beat ourselves up. We say, oh, I must have done something wrong. I must have blown it. There must be some sin in my life. Now, listen, you may be in some of those situations because there's sin in your life. But if you examine your life before God and ask the Spirit of God to search you and show you there's some wicked way in you and he doesn't show you anything, accept that. And understand you're in the circumstance, not because of some sinful thing you've done, but this is part of the will of God for your life. That's what we learned back in... 1 Peter chapter 4, right? That the will of God was that they would suffer for righteousness' sake. And uh, we read there in verse 23 of this chapter, it says, Now when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Merah. 
And the people complained against who? Moses. It's all Moses' fault. That's why this is happening to us. Saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him what? A tree. Now listen, I want you to remember this. All the time that they're complaining against Moses, but if you go over to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 2 to 5, you'll find out that God says, you aren't complaining against Moses, you are complaining against me. You got to think about that next time you want to criticize Pastor Micah. You're not criticizing Pastor Micah, you're criticizing who? You're criticizing God. So we need to be careful about that, how we do it. When you criticize your wife sometimes, man, you just might be criticizing God instead. So watch that in our lives. And, and, he, and, and, and all the time they're murmuring and complaining. You know what's growing right here? God had already made provision to deal with the bitter water, right? And if they'd just gotten on their knees and cried out to God, God would have said what? <laughs> already taken care of that. Take this tree and throw it in the water, and the water will be what? Drinkable. You'll be all right. And God could have told them, look, you just a short journey from here is Elam, and there you're going to find this beautiful oasis. God had that all planned. He knew. There was no need for the criticism and the grumbling and the complaining and all the things that go on. It must have been quite a revelation when they were saying, what's gone wrong? And what God really says, nothing went wrong. Had this all planned. This is part of my plan. This is part of my purpose for your life. And those are hard things to accept when we're in the midst of, of this stuff sometimes in our lives. Somebody said there's two classes of people. Those who bellyache and those who know how to pray. Which are you? Let's be honest. Most of us are where? We know how to bellyache. We know how to murmur and complain real good. What I'm hoping we'll remember after tonight is when we find those things in our lives that make us want to bellyache and complain, what are we going to do instead? Let's take it to the Lord in prayer. We have a God that hears, a God that answers, a God that may have put those frustrating circumstances in your life for the very reason he wanted you to look to him. He wanted to see your salvation in him. He wanted to lead you forward through these things if we would fix our hearts upon the Lord. The whole time they were murmuring, what was there? The tree was there. The deliverance of God was there before them. I, uh, I'm going to come back to my outline, and I'm going to really rush through some things here for you, because I think 1 Peter chapter 4 Look what he says here. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fire trial. Don't think it strange. Well, what should I think of it then? I need to realize that it's not strange. It's what? It's bound to happen. Do you know that? In your life, Micah, some difficult things are just bound to happen. And it's not strange. What he's saying is it's normal. That in life, you're going to face some of these difficult issues in your life. Whether it's dead ends or detours or dry holes. That's part of life. And there's going to be various reasons for them. But realize they're coming. Get yourself prepared. One of the things that's, that you ought to be doing is every day walk with God. Put on your Christian armor. You're going to need that because you're in a spiritual battle. There's a warfare and we don't wrestle with the weapons that are not fleshly or carnal. What? They're, they're the weapons of the Spirit that God's given to us in Ephesians. Realize that it's bound to happen. There's another thing he tells us to do. Number two, he says, verse 13, but what? What is it? Rejoice. That's tough. But isn't it interesting? What does James teach us in James chapter 1 about trials? Do what? Rejoice. In the trials of life. And Peter says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. The word partake there means you're, you're partaker with Christ. It's the word koinonia. It has to do with fellowship. 
when you suffer, you're entering into this fellowship with God. And let me ask you, do you just want to know God in your head and as, as Savior, or do you want to know him intimately? If you're going to know him intimately, you're going to have to walk through some suffering. And some of it better be because you're a believer. Because you're living right for Christ. It should bring some challenges from the world. It should bring some testing from non-believers. The problem is, if you can live your life and you can work somewhere for 10 years and you've never suffered any persecution, it may be because they don't even know you're a Christian. They haven't seen anything to challenge in your life. That's a problem. We ought to have people all over this church that are being challenged every day because of their faith in Christ. And when we are, remember what Paul says, that I want to enter into the fellowship of his what? His sufferings. What he was saying was, I, I want to suffer for Christ, so I enter into the sufferings with Christ. And we grow in our intimacy with Christ I want to tell you, I've met some missionaries over the years that suffer terribly on the field, and you know it immediately when you're in their presence. It changed their lives. And they're such wonderful and warm people, in spite of what they've been through. Why? Because they had learned to rejoice. It's worth it. You know, it used to be that missionaries, when they packed up their belongings and headed off to Africa, they put their belongings in caskets because they expected when they got there, they were going to suffer for Christ and probably die there. Our generation, we got these guys running around shooting baloney all over the place that, boy, if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to be fine. You're not going to get sick. Your finances will be wonderful. You know, you won't be able to get your wallet in your pocket. It's so full of money and all kinds of stuff. But that generation understood, and Peter says, this is the way it's going to be for Christians. You're going to suffer. Don't think it's strange. But rejoice in it. You remember the early disciples, I think it was Acts chapter 4, said they, they got beaten for preaching the gospel and told not to preach it anymore, and they came back and told everybody about it and said they rejoiced that they were what? Counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Would that God would get us to that place, because listen, we're going to need to get there. Because this world's turning on the church very, very fast. And born-again believers are, are seen to be the enemy of the state of our country. And they're going to be on our backs. Learn to rejoice. There's another thing he teaches us here. He says, uh, uh, down to verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian... Now listen, he's not saying if you suffer because you're a jerk. Because you're the most annoying person at work. That's not what he's talking about. He said if you suffer as a what? as a Christian, because you're a believer and you're living out your faith, and because when you sit around with a bunch of men and they're using filthy language and dirty stories, you don't join into that. And they think it's strange, as we already read earlier in chapter 4, that you don't join with them in it, and so they question you. We live in a day that so turned things around that if there's a young man, a teenager, a guy in his 20s, that's a virgin, he don't want to say anything about it because he's looked upon like there's something wrong with him today. We need some Christians that'll stay virgins and aren't ashamed. Isn't that what he says? Aren't ashamed to stand up and say, I'm not doing that. I'm waiting. I'm going to be a virgin when I get married because I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Christ. And I have a different heart because of Christ and what he's doing in my life. And so, we need that. He says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. My third point is, refuse to be ashamed. Absolutely refuse to be ashamed that you're a Christian. Stand up, speak out, say something. I remember Jim Browning from New Brunswick Bible Institute coming out to South Portage, New Brunswick. And a bunch of us were there on a Saturday morning getting ready for a hockey game, and our, my team was all around in one corner, and Jim, big tall guy, walks out in the middle of us. He says, anybody here a Christian? Now, about half the team went to the Baptist church. 
And not one of them said a word. And I'm this little shy, intimidated guy from the United Church that had just gotten saved. And this isn't me. This was Christ in me. Opened my mouth and said, yeah, I am. I want to tell you, that did something for me. Right? rest of my life, I've never been ashamed. If somebody says, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm sitting down in the car dealership, and somebody looks over. I was reading a Christian book the other day. Are you a Christian? Yep. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am not ashamed, right, of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Why in the world will we be ashamed? And if it leads to suffering... So be it. But let's not be ashamed of Jesus when we deal with suffering and face it in our lives. He's going to tell us, he says, uh, let, him, let him glorify God in this matter. You know what? When you suffer as a Christian, you bring glory to God. You say, he made a change in my life. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of Christ? Remember the end of those that don't know Christ, but don't, don't forget this. Remember the reward that's waiting for you. If you've lived obediently and faithful for him, there's going to be a reward for a faithful life that's not ashamed of Jesus and not ashamed to what? To suffer for Christ and has entered into the fellowship of sufferings with the Lord. Remember your reward. He says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Commit your souls to the faithful creator so you can be what? A faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Remember to remain faithful in the face of the sufferings and the trials and the difficulties that life brings your way.